I'd like to say something about the Q&A session. I've heard it said about history programs that question and answers go on too long. <laughs> and I'd like to point out, first of all, it's valuable information for historical record. We take these programs for that, so I'm not inclined to stop the question and answer at any point. And anyone who wants to leave at any time is perfectly free to. You don't have to now or during the question and answers. Peter. <laughs> Uh, those who do not learn from history are compelled to repeat it. <laughs> and I'd like to suggest that, that even though many of the good ideas have started to be published and published well, that there are also important aspects of it that don't really uh, transmit their value to subsequent generations except in the form of code. So I'd like to ask the following two questions. Number one, uh, can anyone make a substantial case why Xerox should not put the entire source code of STAR into the public domain? And number two, were Xerox to do such a thing, would it be, would it be possible to find it? <laughs> you, should, you should repeat the question. Is, for, uh, the, uh, Peter's question is, is there any substantial argument as to why the STAR source code ought not now to be put in the public domain. And secondly, if there were an agreement that that were an acceptable thing to do, could anyone lay hands on the original star source code or a facsimile thereof in order to do that? Um, I can't possibly answer either of those questions except to say I, can't, I cannot myself automatically see um, a reason why it couldn't be as some other classical source code is um, uh, in the public domain, but that would be an issue for Xerox to to uh, sort out the the other question, though, about the availability of it, um, who knows? I, I, I imagine it must I think be. Right. Answer, yeah. um, well, in fact, up until two, three months ago, um, Xerox was still supporting the products. Um, there had there had been a new virtual machine implementation built that ran on top of Windows. It runs very fast, actually, um, and um, they tell me that they have gigabytes of stuff, but they're not quite sure what versions and stuff because it's just a small crew that was finishing the maintenance. Um, they stopped supporting it just recently. I suggest you talk to someone at Xerox. Mark Weiser is nearby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You said there was There is a virtual machine implementation. It is a Xerox product that never sold until about two months ago. It runs on? It runs on PCs, Windows. We have a question over, way over here. Is the Star program, uh, is the Star program uh, the year 2000 complaint? Is it year 2005? They have no way. Oh, there's a, but there's a wonderful answer to this, actually. Uh, it, although it's not year 2000 compliant, it does have some fairly nice features about uh, uh, dealing with dates and other things like that. When is it? It hasn't blown up yet, though. Is it year 2000 when it hits the wall, or is there something earlier? I think the time step actually blows up around 2020 or something like that. Yeah. I think that there is a problem with the configuration software, which uh, if Alan can rewrite it, it doesn't let you uh, configure a new star. I tried entering 00, zero and it said no way. Uh, that but that's so just, actually. that's your code? Okay. Yeah. But that was... <laughs> <laughs> but that's just the code to uh, to set the time on the machine. It had a few idiosyncrasies where it really couldn't keep time forever. Um, so we, it, we tried. So it is year 2000 compliant. It's not year 2020 compliant. Ron Crane. Uh, no, sorry, no, the, the XNS time protocol is the 32-bit number, which is the number of seconds since January 1, 1901. And that 32-bit counter rolls over around. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, regarding chip bridge, who's the person who designed it? Uh, Xerox is still using it. Uh, it it's a wonderful program that uh, uh, IC designers will, will love to have it in the end. Do you know anything about it? What was the name of the program? Chip bridge. Chip bridge? No, no, no. Programming. 
We just an announced the number for uh, IC design. We would run IC. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We just use SIL and, and, uh, and, and you, didn't, you weren't allowed to design ICs. <laughs> yeah, what is that? Oh, Charles. Yeah. Uh, One of the things I thought would be useful for, for Dave to comment on is, is the design methodology that we use and the fact that we design this based on abstract notions about the functionality for rather than the specifics of what we're doing. So they may need to say something about that. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. On the first day, good. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Charles asked about some comments about the work that was done um, on the design methodology. Dave Smith referred earlier to the fact that it was done in a principled way. Uh, in fact, um, I commissioned a, uh, you might say, a task force, uh, which uh, Charles Irby uh, chaired, as it were, to develop a methodology first. So before we did the design, we decided on a methodology for user interface design um, so that we'd be able properly to manage both the process and the abstractions that we were going to be working on. And then as the user interface design was done um, in stages and to attack different tasks, there was a very sort of con consistent approach. The information display was designed independently from the function invocation, for example, which turned out to matter a great deal. And both of those were designed independently from the user's conceptual model. And this was the first time that anything like this had been done, either the development of a methodology per se or then a principled user interface design. Um, that's one of the reasons why STAR, from a usability point of view, is such a great improvement over most of its successors, is because we actually did it by designing it using a set of principles rather than just sort of randomly copying what someone else had done or kind of debugging it into existence. So that turned out to be very important. Um, um, Charles himself and, and uh, Dave Smith, Eric Harslam, and Ralph Kimball, along with Linda Bergstenson um, and a number of people from Park who were still in Park proper but were happily helped us by joining our task force and uh, I include uh, Larry Tesler, um, Charles Simony, um, at least Bill Verplank, a number of other people as well. So it was a big and very um, focused effort. Um, some people thought, gee, it's a long period of time just to decide what you're going to decide or to design how you're going to do the design. But I feel that it uh, really served the process and the subsequent in industry very well. Yes. It seems pretty clear that one of the major shortcomings of STAR was the thing that you cited about the turnkey closed model as opposed to somehow seeing in the crystal ball that the independent software market was going to come into existence. Uh, there was some speculation that part at the time that such a software market would come into existence, but of course it was all just speculation. I, I'd be curious about what you think and, and what Dave Smith thinks also about whether that was uh, something that at, at the time was just impossible to have foreseen in the start of the program and would have just been overreaching itself. Or whether, looking back on it, you feel like, gee, you know, I wish we'd gone the other way and tried to make it another platform. Well, I'll say what I thought, and, and, and I think I'll be approaching it too. The question was um, uh, in retrospect, um, doesn't it seem as if you could have? thought that you should provide more of a programmable open system, even though there wasn't an independent software industry at the time. And uh, we actually did make the XDE, the Xerox Development Environment, in such a way that it could be packaged up and shipped. And we did begin shipping it to customers about, if I remember, about 18 months after we launched the product. It was, however, designed for fairly serious pr hardcore programming use. And we did not understand a lot about what it meant to export and support that kind of an environment. But I, um, it, it actually always was a part of the plan to do that. We just did not put it in front of the other objectives. Later on, of course, some of the objectives for the program changed. But um, I generally feel that if it, ha it had happened earlier, we might have been more a part of jump-starting a better, earlier, um, soft independent software 
uh, industry. The first few years of the PC software industry were pretty rocky, and uh, largely because of the tools and so on that were available. So I, I th see it as an opportunity partially missed. Actually, there was a um, that was back here in '83. There was a project called Phoenix, what was which was taking essentially the Tahoe uh, toolkit. Dave, Dave mentioned that I think he mentioned today. Maybe he mentioned last time. And one of the problems was we didn't have a toolkit installed. That that, that, that drawing on, on the screen required everybody to draw on, on, on the screen. Well, in Tahoe, there was a toolkit for doing that. And in the Phoenix project, um, a toolkit was built. And originally, and, and it became Viewpoint. Viewpoint was an open toolkit-based architecture that intended for um, third parties to develop software for. Um, you had to develop in Mesa and required a little more learning than what most people had. And But it, about 84, 85, we started shipping Viewpoint um, to allow people to do just what you suggested. Uh, can we have the volume up a little higher? I, I would like to make uh, one more comment about the previous question, Charles Irby's question about the design methodology. Um, Dave Liddell is correct that we, before we did the design, we did the design for the design. And it's interesting that uh, the principles that we came up with are no big surprises to people today. Anyone in the human factors business, anyone who goes to a SIGCHI conference or reads the journals, it's all pretty standard stuff. It's, it was doing user testing. It's analyzing the tasks that users are doing in their context, trying to figure out what objects they're using and what actions they're performing on the objects. And in fact, um, we, we went out many times in the early days to various sites um, and decomposed in excruciating detail the tasks that people were performing, went back and did a design that would, uh, would enable you to accomplish those very same functions, but hopefully in a much simpler and more improved way. I think it's very revealing from an historical standpoint that the SIGCHI organization formed after STAR came out. It, uh, the first SIGCHI conference was in 1982. Yes. Uh, that might be interesting to the speakers. Uh, I work at Clark, and just uh, last week I had a visit from a colleague at Fuji Xerox, the Japan branch of Xerox. He told me that uh, the global view of JSTAR and product in Japan is still active, and, had been, uh, and that Sony Corporation this year had selected it for, for a system D that they had. And then, for good measure, we uh, opened up a global view system here and the, net, and the network icons. And I dropped a document on this guy's printer at Fuji Xerox in Japan, and it worked. So, uh, <laughs> Of, of J Star and Fuji Xerox and, and so on, I I very well remember when Bill English and and I and Joe Becker and others were there for the launch of the Fuji Xerox J Star. Bill and Joe, of course, had been there in Japan several years getting that program working, and I was not very used to uh, the way that literal translations from Japanese turn into English. Um, phraseology and uh, so uh, after the, the after the launch that is on the day of the launch the booth was absolutely packed with uh, people of all kinds particularly competitors people from other companies and so on looking at the product and I remember one of the Fuji Xerox uh, marketing folks translating for me the review that was written the next day in the paper and um, he said it was, it was clear in real time he was thinking how to phrase this back to me, and he said, the Fuji, the Fuji Xerox star is as different from conventional computer interaction as clouds from mud. <laughs> and I thought, boy, you can't do any better than that. You know? Hold on just a second. 
I think that Mark was talking about the international features of STAR and how they were a big uh, element in, in the sales that we did have. We should recognize the years of hard and very creative and dedicated work of the man who did, who was largely responsible for the internationalization of STAR, and that is Joe Becker. without whom a lot of these um, tough issues, especially like um, making a selection in Arabic, which starts like this, and then if there's an English word, it, it'll go the other way, and then when you go back to Arabic, the selection will go the other and he made it I all work. That. Oh, and then he said, and what if the writer is writing in Arabic and they're quoting something in Hebrew? <laughs> right. That's what's really he figured it out. Right. Yes? At some point, you realize that you screwed up. You could back up and say, "No, no, do it like this. Back up down down the call stack, force a call differently, you know, passing different variables, and go in and, and say, "No, no, skip over this and do that." And this was in 80, 87, something like that. You know, it was just amazing tools available that, according to my friends who are still you know, writing code tell me they're just now starting to see this stuff in some of the new Microsoft products. Um, I'm probably the most nerdy person in this group and I can't answer the questions anymore because I've done, done human interface. But if you find like, oh, this man right here. <laughs> um, Charles, Charles Haynes, who was the debugger person who put in, well, and, and, and other things. Um, talk to him afterwards, okay? <laughs> Did the machine actually end up on the desks of uh, high-level Fortune 500 executives? The question is, uh, for how long were sales significant, and did the machines wind up on the desks of Fortune 500 professionals? I can, I can answer the second part. I was only here through most of 1982, and then went off and tried to put it similar but different machines on the desk of Fortune 500 professionals, not to print documents, but do other funny data-like things. Um, it is certainly the case that the primary customers were the biggest customers you can imagine. That is, it did indeed go prim virtually always to professionals. As a matter of fact, it was hard to get the sales force to quit trying to sell it to word processing people. Word processing people were proud of their ability to withstand pain, you know, and to know all these complicated commands, and they were not the the target, and it definitely went in modest numbers, I admit, to that very target um, audience. Uh, who can say what was the period over which Star was sold on the various different platforms, including the song? I don't know if any of us have the right answer for that. Yes, way at the back. Uh, I've done a lot of design and I wanted to say thank you. But I also wondered who invented the undo command? <laughs> <laughs> the question is the question following a complimentary statement about a design. <laughs> who invented the undo command? Now, as far as I know, Warren Teitelman invented the undo command in Interlisp, uh, or its BBN Lisp, its prior name. I believe that's true, and it was culturally very 
strong here in park, and so it was not optional not to have it in in the system. I think it's fair to say that the idea that the ability to make text editing documents undoable uh, flows from J. Struther Moore's uh, piece table invention, which was the thing that made it possible to have a text document in which you could still undo it by not irrevocably committing the data structure. Um, that at least would be my assessment. What else? Well, yeah. um, as far as undo goes, I, we might as well uh, come clean here. <laughs> Dave's trying to get a picture of the keyboard. Uh, if we could switch to the camera for a second. All right. Well, there is a key labeled on the keyboard, undo. Oh, he's got it now, Dave. Oh, he's not. He's got the camera now. No. Dave, Dave. <laughs> yeah, at any rate, it's one of the function keys on there. And uh, we thought that as designers, that was enough to ensure that it would actually be implemented. <laughs> Unfortunately, in our naivety, we were wrong. And it was never implemented. Oh, and Star did not actually have undo. However, we did have one, uh, one thing that we did uh, win when it comes to undo. We used to have a contest. Can you find the sentence in the star functional spec that causes the most implementation work? That was the sentence. Every command can be undone by pushing the undo key. Right. Yeah. When they, you talked about names for the product, and one of the original ones was, was to be Daybree for the star. How, how, did, the, how did the term star, how did the name star? No, the, the name star was made up by Bob Spinrad, who was at that time vice president of system development. He was the head of SDD at that time. And he and I were once again trying to sell it to yet another skeptical senior executive. And we had just been put into the clutches of um, Dave Culbertson, who um, happened to be a sailing enthusiast. And so Spinrad said, let's name it after a, um, a one, uh, you know, a, a sailboat class, OK, a one design sailing class. Uh, maybe that will cause him to be interested in it. And <laughs> star, well, you know, it wasn't very easy to get Dave interested in things. You know? And um, the star was um, both a decent, interesting uh, one design sailboat and also a tolerable name for um, an office appliance. I mean, we looked at a number of other ones, but, you know, somehow lightning didn't quite do it and, you know, sunfish and yeah, everything else, but star seemed okay. That's where it came from. Yeah. Yeah, Daybreak was the name of the 1685 launch. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, what was your question? Is there any idea how many were actually ever produced? Something like 30,000. Yes. Uh, I've got a quick topic during the GUI, which I'm a strong supporter of, but recently you may have noticed there's something about backlash against the auditory the GUIs, or maybe it's more of a muddling would be a better word for it. Uh, with the longest perspective, perhaps, of most folks on object-oriented GUIs, has your faith in object-oriented GUIs uh, been shaken at all? Not badly enough to call them GUIs, but we know it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Out of curiosity, if you were to look at the descent lines from the, the star, there's a lot of them. What would be the first and maybe some of the second layer ones that you would consider to be obviously descended from, ex, descended from the star? At least an idea, a mimetic concept, if you will. I'm thinking particularly that the Lisa might have been the closest. Well, there are a few that were licensees, okay? That is. There was a product done at Sun called, I forget, but it was Sun, the Porto of Sun, the Porto of the Sun. There was a toolkit done at Sun under license from Open Look. Open Look. Oh, Open Look. Open Open Look. Look. Thank you, right, which was a direct descendant. Similarly, the product that we did at Metaphor, we actually had a license for as well, and it was a, a clear direct descendant. Lisa had some similarities and some 
difference is it was more similar than the Macintosh was. Obviously, there was, uh, you should pardon the expression, next step, and, uh, and uh, motif. Um, uh, what was it? Yeah, the, the perk had some similarities and some differences as well. What else? Other guys can think about well, it. Well, actually, um, this article by Jeff Johnson that uh, Dave referred to, which are up here, has a very nice chart in it that has quite a dependency a graph of uh, star and everything. So you're invited to come up here and take a look at that. Uh, a lot of hay has been made over uh, a certain uh, visit by Steve Jobs when he showed up here and looked at everything. Whether that exists or not, uh, maybe there's a story there, maybe not. But I'm uh, more curious. Uh, you would read a lot, especially maybe in the last 10 years, about how Xerox invented it and everybody else got rich off of it. And I'm just curious from what was the, you know, what can you say about the attitudes or the feelings inside Xerox, uh, inside Park, you know, watching these other machines, you know, garbage, not so much garbage, whatever, making a lot of money. Was it the proud child of our ideas? Was it the goddamn fool of our this, ideas? I mean, <laughs> We just simply wanted our ideas to go out there in the world, and we weren't at all concerned with commercial success. <laughs> Ken. Hi, it's Ken here. I'm, uh, I started off before the start at Activision. Dave hired me in. I've been at Park for about 20 years. I just want to say this in public. Two of the inventions at Park, okay, make Xerox over $2 billion a year in gross revenues. Just two of them, all right? So we're very proud of the money that we have made for this corporation. And they are the DocuTech and the DocuPrint Prince. The other thing, okay, I thought you were gonna tell one of my favorite stories and I just have to substitute a couple of words. Uh, remind me, the star I think was unveiled at the 1981 NCC for the rest of the world, and the booth was packed, and the Japanese press was there, and they went back and wrote all about it, and when it was translated to me in just the same way, um, the translator looked at it and said, this says that the Xerox star disemboweled the competition. <laughs> Yeah, I decided to leave that part out, but that's that's true. Research. <laughs> yeah, Dave, I heard a rumor a long time ago that when the Department of Defense was designing ADA, they came to Xerox and asked if they could use Mesa instead, and we said no. <laughs> um, the last question was that he had heard that long ago, when uh, the DoD had that high order language thing on the street, what eventually became ADA, and that they came to Xerox and asked if they could, quote, have Mesa, and that Xerox said no. Um, I don't think that's quite correct. I do remember someone asking permission for us to give a briefing to the ADA committee about a number of the features that were in Mesa, because we hadn't at that time yet really written widely about at least some of the features that were in, that were in Mesa. And we did give, we did sign off on that briefing happening. I think what you may have heard is that th we were asked if we would like to take essentially an ARPA contract to, uh, as it were, um, uh, harden Mesa to, to be that ADA. And we said no, because we didn't want to do contracting. We were actually trying to construct these um, commercial products, but that's my recollection about it. Peter, do you remember anything about that? Um, that what, what, what was uh, just said, does ring a faint bell that, that, um, that there, was, there was interest in Mesa as part of the ADA effort. Uh, I don't remember um, whether, and, and I'm pretty sure that there was, there was some Xerox political reason why Mesa was not submitted as one of the candidates in the, in the ADA competition. Uh, the person who probably would know the most about that is Butler Lamson. Yeah, maybe Satterquid. I remember coming to me and asking, how much Dick, can Dick we... Sweet, do you know anything about that? Uh, 
No, no more than what you said. Okay. What if that? Go ahead, Jan. Um, what about uh, Nicholas Stewart? When he was at Park, he patterned a lot of module two after his. Is that correct? The question is, didn't uh, did did uh, Nicholas Stewart's um, uh, visit to Park? and his exposure to MESA have impact to how he designed Modula 2. I think he, he certainly has said that. I think he's um, quoted that as one of the sources of, of his um, ideas. Yeah. yeah um, the Xerox parts, I mean, the interface from Star clearly made text-based interfaces obsolete, main lines obsolete, and it hasn't really been better in 17 years. Someday, it's obviously going to be obsolete too. And I was wondering if you had any ideas or thoughts or any research that's been done in Xerox about stuff that's way beyond that type of interface. As far as user interaction. Um, uh, the question was that uh, given that the that the, the Xerox Star and the interface approach that it sort of exemplifies or embodies still seems to be a leading. Um, uh, form and the strong successor to the old text-based interfaces. Uh, he was really asking about opinions about uh, things which will uh, compare to the Xerox Star as clouds to mud. That is, <laughs> what, what, what is it that will what, what is it that will obsolete obsolete the graphic user interface? I think the answer is pretty clear. It's still Windows 98. <laughs> <laughs> No doubt about it. Well, except of course, today you draw a couple of laps. I will say, was one of the designers of the Star interface. I am a little disappointed that in the last decade we haven't really pushed much beyond this desktop metaphor with its documents and folders. I mean, uh, even at Apple, I was unable to get them to willingly go beyond this metaphor. They were just too successful for too long and developed too much inertia. Uh, you know, I, I would like to see it pushed in directions of information retrieval. Now, one of the neatest things about the internet are all the, uh, the search engines that are out there. Those are just great. And there's no reason you can't do that on your local machine as well. And there's a lot of areas that we could make progress in. And there hasn't been uh, sufficient, anyway, innovation in the last decade. I'd say that's pretty clear. Yeah, I'll, I'll second this as a hardware designer. You know, having the uh, having our MIP rate go from uh, half to uh, 500 and, and seeing the user interface barely uh, change has been an incredible disappointment. I remember uh, on the Star software, if you wanted to run the spelling checker, that was a big deal. You know, you waited a while. In fact, we had spelling checker servers. You know, now in <laughs> so this is the biggest chain that's happened in ten years is now PowerPoint does spelling checking while you're, you know, entering the characters. And I I predicted that would happen someday, I remember. So that's the only change I've seen now in seventeen years is spelling correction is as you type. Also pagination. Hey, no, don't do that. Don't don't do that. Yeah. It's okay. Word still has pagination, it's called fast save. I spent some time at SDR. I spent some time at Tokyo Graphics working with the Nintendo game machine and technology and so forth. And even though I'm not a video game person, if you look at the number of children that are growing up with amazing skill at playing these very, very fast video games. And you think about some of the navigational technology there and some of the methodology for moving around in the space and doing things in that space, especially if it's interacting with you in kind of an entertaining way, it seems to me that there's the germ of a new UI paradigm in there somewhere. I don't know quite what it is yet. And it's certainly not a video game per se, but, but I think it can build on some of the same technology. Well, certainly today we can, uh, we can build our microprocessors with things like the 3D acceleration for free, essentially. So if I, I am... I really, I know that there was the Insight Group here, which I visited a little while ago. I would, I would really like to see, you know, something utilize the transistors better on the chip for the user interface. And if it's 3D, we can do it for free, essentially. So we're at that point on technology, but that's possible. I think, I think Charles actually um, identified anybody who's interested in pursuing it. I'm not in that business myself, but 
uh, a direction to go in trying to push the interface forward, look at uh, games. Look at video games. So, so I want to see a prototype because we're doing silicon that, that we need. Uh, I, I'm just shocked. There's no university research or no you know, research at all in this area, and I, I really would like to see a prototype. And I'll give you the hardware if you give me the software prototype. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, what about all of the, the VR stuff? It's a good start. So, go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about the invention of uh, the Mesa programming language and why you decided to choose Mesa as the language for pilot and co-pilot in the start? Sure. Uh, the question is, how was Mesa invented and why did we decide to use it? Um, uh, the other language uh, alternatives that we had at that time fell into two classes. They were, they were either very much uh, very superior for quickly building prototypes or even building large elaborate systems, but had the, the well-known performance difficulties that you would expect with these two very powerful systems we had here, namely Interlisp and Smalltalk. Okay. It was not practical, obviously, to do an implementation in those, although Smith stubbornly um, continued to prototype um, in, uh, in them for as long as he possibly could. Um, the other set of alternatives that was available at that time weren't sufficiently type safe or had, didn't have the right set of abstractions and so on for building industrial strength software of which you hope to sell hundreds of thousands of copies. So and that was primarily BCPL. C even um, didn't exist at that time. That splendid language embodying the grade given to its designer. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't even here in that, in that moment, so it was BCPL or other very um, weakly protected machine-oriented languages. So Mesa was actually quite a nice design. It had a few excesses in it that took us a little while to get out, but it gave us tremendous reliability uh, in constructing this elaborate piece of software. And by God, you made a change to things and it started running again the way it was supposed to and so on. So this was a curious window in the history of programming languages. and the idea of building a big software system that was nevertheless going to be replicated and sold very cheaply so you couldn't ship a systems engineer with every copy was really quite new. And, and uh, that was uh, the reason for the Mesa choice. Peter. Um, I'd like to just add a little footnote to that. There was, there was a, a, a working group at PARC that, that met a number of times. It was a very high-powered group. Uh, looking at the requirements for a uh, programming language for the work to be done at PARC itself. And while that group was not directly coupled to the, to the uh, evolution of, of uh, MESA and MESA's follow, follows on, in fact, in fact, MESA had already been developed um, to, a, to a fair point by that time, uh, there were, there were um, ideas coming directly from PARC as to what a modern system programming language needed. Uh, that that I think influenced uh, Mesa, the choice of Mesa, very heavily. For example, the fact that, that Mesa has a very rich type, safe, type system and is generally very type safe. Uh, this was not a a popular uh, point of view for uh, you know hardcore system programming in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. Uh, and uh, and I think that that uh, it's fair to say that the, that the, that the that the Mesa artifact, the ideas in it, uh, originated pretty much at Park, and and that and that it was it was the apt the apt tool to hand when when the star was being programmed. Yes, yeah, over here. Um, I want to respond to the thing that uh, Charles mentioned about uh, 3D interfaces being a direction to explore. It's uh, uh, amusing to me that the rage in video games right now are 3D multiplayer network games. I recall many years ago, Maze War being a very early 3D... <laughs> <laughs> my in fact, the best thing about Maze War, the thing that I appreciated about Maze War, was that otherwise I never would have gotten people to be willing to test all that complicated internetworking code. And no, no, I'm perfectly serious. It was a wretched testing problem, but people playing Maze, Maze War absolutely tortured every, every line of that code, and I was tremendously grateful for that idea. Dick. Uh, in response to the question uh, about uh, why Mesa, uh, Dick Kerber was kind enough to uh, take a, a paper that I had written back in 85 and, and scanned in with uh, uh, 
Matt Corbett captured. I uh, put on his website, uh, which doesn't really go all the way back in history to the stuff uh, Peter was talking about, but it, it has some, it has a bibliography that does, and it, it's a fairly clear description of uh, Tahoe, the state of Tahoe, circa 1985. So. Uh, um, I don't know if we can make the URL for that available, but uh, yeah. we'll publish that. I can give another URL. If, go ahead. If you just go, to, well, I will have to put it on tonight. But if you go to Sweet <laughs> Shop, <laughs> you go to www.sweetshop.com. Spell S W E E T S H O P P E. Uh, that happens to, to be my web, uh, a website that my wife uh, gave me when she changed her domain name. Uh, <laughs> I'll put it. I'll put a copy of the paper there. <laughs> Not a question, just uh, part trivia. I believe it is true that the maze war, all the programmers were playing all the time, and of course they, we were all hackers and we were hacking the sources. And as a result of that, the authors got upset with everyone making cheats. And therefore, they stored the sources in an encrypted form on the source tree. And I believe, out of all the software innovation that's happening in the park, the Mayport sources were the only software stored in an encrypted form. <laughs> <laughs> did the uh, Starship with any hidden Easter eggs that you know of? Um, the question is did Starship with any hidden Easter eggs that I know of? Uh, let me assure you, not any that I knew of. <laughs> but I wouldn't bet that there weren't. What else? Okay, thank you very much.